and the first speaker of the session today who is Mr. John Oldfield. He is from Global Water 2020 and he is leading the Global Water 2020 at the moment. He is the principal there and he is uh, an expert of water sanitation hygiene policy issues. He has been part of the top management of many international organizations like he was the CEO of Water 2017 was advocate, and he studied uh, uh, in Georgetown Universities in Iris, with a specialization in Foreign Service, International Affairs, and Economics. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. And now floor is to you. So once again, before we are starting, we have a time limit for all the speakers. Is we are requesting speakers to finish their talk by 12 minutes, and then three minutes would be for uh, the question and answer session. So total 15, total 15 minutes for uh, uh, every uh, speaker's time. Thank you so much, John. Great, uh, Satya, th thank you, and, and thank your colleagues for, for hosting uh, this important session today. It's an honor for me to join you from Global Water 2020 here in Washington, D.C. And it's good to see some familiar faces and a lot of, a lot of new faces. So, so thank you all for the honor. Uh, I want to spend uh, my, my 12 minutes here talking about, talking about advocacy, talking about professional advocacy uh, as the means to accelerating progress towards SDG 6 uh, for water sanitation and hygiene. And frankly, as the means to, uh, to accelerating progress towards uh, most of the other SDGs as well. Uh, as, as Satya said, I am a principal with Global Water 2020 here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are a nonprofit advocacy organization focused specifically on accelerating progress towards SDG 6 and any number of other complementary uh, SDGs as well. Uh, we are not a, a programming organization. We don't implement projects across the globe. Uh, we don't make any grants, but we certainly do look for ways to support uh, through technical assistance or other means, uh, any number of other advocacy efforts across, uh, across the developing world in particular. Uh, our goal is simply to go exponential. Uh, right now in the WASH sector, uh, WASH of course is an acronym for, for water sanitation and hygiene, Right now in the wash sector, my, my sense is we're making incremental progress. Uh, we are making small improvements at many levels every year. My goal is to go exponential. My goal is to significantly accelerate the rate of progress, which, which the issue clearly merits. So as, a, as an advocate for WASH, uh, based in Washington, D.C., my job is, of course, to raise awareness of solutions to global water challenges. But my job is also then to convert that heightened awareness of those solutions to, to stronger policies, to stronger programs, to stronger budgets across the WASH space. Now we do this in the United States by working with the US Congress, uh, by working with the US administration. You know, for example, the Department of State and the US Agency for International Development. And we work with partners across the entirety of, of, of U.S. society, and I'll get into that. All with this same goal of significantly accelerating progress and playing to the strengths of various constituencies within and beyond the U.S. government. So uh, successful advocacy in the WASH sector for us requires a uh, sometimes very difficult combination, a balancing act between strategy and flexibility, between long long-term strategic goals and short to medium term uh, opportunism uh, to be able to take advantage of situations as, as they arise. Uh, so I am, I am biased. I, I do work at an advocacy organization. Um, and, and, and I think that the key uh, to accelerating progress, not just towards WASH, but towards any of the SDGs, which is particularly interesting for this conversation today is, is advocacy. And more specifically, it's, advocacy in developing countries, not in the United States, not in the donor community. So I wanna spend just a few minutes discussing that. And the rationale for this is that uh, 
for whatever development challenge you're, you're trying to tackle, whether it's education or health or, or WASH or IT infrastructure, the, the vast majority of the financial support needs to come from not the donor community, but from what I call domestic resource mobilization, DRM, from some combination of public and private finance in developing countries for, uh, for each of these needs, WASH, health, education, and so on. And, and therefore, uh, my sense is that governments in developing countries themselves need to prioritize WASH. Uh, and I also sense that they are not currently, at least not to the extent that the, the WASH issue merits, uh, particularly during times of, of COVID. So these remarks, my remarks today, uh, yeah, they're, they're about WASH, but they are also about yeah. politics. They're also about political leaders, and they're also about money. They're also about financial support for the sector. So, um, you know, my, my keys to success uh, for advocacy uh, my, my keys to success for for advocacy for wash uh, are, are three or four I want to want to share with you briefly today first of all uh, place multiple bets you know we, we need and, and by that I mean we need to focus our advocacy efforts on senior elected political leadership uh, presidents, prime ministers, MPs, but we also, as successful advocates, need to focus on civil servants, on IAS in India, you know, many of whom will be in the, these positions across their countries for, uh, for years, for, for decades sometimes. So we need to focus not just on MPs, members of parliament, but on their staff. Uh, these staff often stay in parliament in one capacity or another for their careers working for MPs personally, working for committees, working for subcommittees. So these staff are an immense asset above and beyond uh, the, the elected political leaders. And depending on the situation in, in any given country, uh, the same may well apply uh, in a, a decentralized or a devolved political environment uh, in India, in Bangladesh, in Kenya. Uh, all of these same lessons may apply at provincial and local levels as well. So place multiple bets on political and non-political leadership. Secondly, um, for successful advocacy, uh, I make, an, I make an, what I consider to be an important distinction between strategy and strategic capacity. Um, yes, we need to be strategic. Yes, my colleagues and I have our five-year plan, but we also need to be opportunistic. We need to be flexible enough to, to roll with the punches, to take the bad news and move on. We also need to be flexible enough to jump at opportunities when they arise. And I consider, um, as anathema as this might sound, but I consider COVID to be just that opportunity. I think there is significant downside, but also significant upside to COVID. Successful advocacy also requires this, this constantly changing mix of, of messages, of messengers, of targets, of platforms and of timing. And I can give you, uh, you know, more details about my thinking about this, this recipe um, offline if you want. This, this recipe of messages, messengers, targets, timing, and platforms uh, will change all the time for all sorts of different reasons. But without those five key ingredients, uh, something's going to be missing in, in my advocacy efforts and in your advocacy efforts. And it, it's important, I think, for, for this conference in particular, whose, whose remit is, is very broad, essentially all of the SDGs, to think about reaching beyond your sector for allies. So, for example, if I in the WASH sector want to successfully advocate for WASH in hospitals or for WASH in healthcare facilities, I need to reach out far beyond the WASH sector. I need to spend more time with the health sector than I am with the WASH sector. Uh, same with education. You know, if, if you as an advocate for education want more, uh, more girl students in your classrooms, you need to work with the, the WASH sector uh, to make sure that those girls are not spending their childhoods hauling water on their heads. Those girls need to be hauling school books, not water. And likewise, older girls, if they don't have menstrual hygiene products and training, 
they're going to lose one week each month of school because of a lack of, of MHM, of menstrual hygiene management products. Uh, and, and eventually they're going to, to fall so far behind that they will just drop out of school. So reach far beyond your sector. So the, the third uh, key to success in, in my advocacy is just, just commitment. Uh, I need to make more conscious, longer term bets on advocacy. Uh, I need to double down on my advocacy efforts, particularly when times are tough and, and do what I can to emerge from a difficult situation like COVID uh, more strongly positioned when I went in. And the example I would give you is uh, I, I don't want water utilities just to keep, just to maintain their level of service during COVID. That's as hard as that is. During COVID, I want water and wastewater utilities to actually expand their service. Why? Well, because first of all, it's important. Secondly, COVID has made it very, very clear that safe drinking water and sanitation and hygiene, hand washing with soap, is absolutely pivotal to preventing the spread of infectious disease. So, you know, who am I not to take advantage of, of COVID? Who am I just to focus on the downside of COVID? Uh, you know, for my country in the United States, there is a significant downside of COVID, but there was also uh, an upside, particularly for those of us in the WASH advocacy uh, space. And, and, and lastly, be, be patient, but, but stay, stay at it. Be nice, but be forceful. There are a lot of, uh, of equally valid, you know, what I call angles to, or approaches to the water issue. So one of your MPs might be interested in girls' education. You know the angle there. One might be interested in the linkages between WASH and health. You know the angle there. Another MP might, might be interested in transboundary water issues uh, between a country and its neighbors. Well, you know the angles there. So be flexible. Be prepared to speak the language of the person sitting across the table from you and then to make your ask. So my call to action for you in my, my last minute here today is three or four ideas. You know, first of all, we, we need more professional, and by that I mean paid, WASH advocates across the globe. And, and I certainly welcome your help in identifying those and, and finding ways to lend our support from Washington, D.C. Uh, secondly, my call to action is to, to, to think seriously about what 100% actually means in your work. Think seriously about the SDGs. Think seriously about leaving absolutely no one behind. 100% is doable. That's not the question. Uh, but are we serious about it? That's the question. Um, I'm enjoying my, my, uh, my work with Satya focused on 100% coverage of WASH in healthcare facilities in one district in India. I think that's exciting. Yes, it's only one district, relatively small geography, but it is 100% and that is doable. My call to action to those of you in nonprofit organizations, in NGOs, in academia, is to please build advocacy into your programs. Uh, make sure that governments at, at, at many levels are aware of and involved in your research and programs. And lastly, my call to action for everybody, including myself, is to, to take advantage of COVID. Look at the, the upsides of COVID not just the downsides. Uh, met, think about how important COVID has, has made hand washing with soap. Think about how important COVID has made safe drinking water more broadly for health. So take advantage of COVID, be bold. Don't just tread water, but take advantage of this uh, hopefully unique situation to ask for bigger budgets, stronger policies, stronger programs for WASH. So I, uh, I'm grateful to be here. I look forward to learning from you all today. And I personally hope to emerge from this session with, with more ideas and more allies for WASH advocacy work across the globe. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk on the topic of advocacy. So now uh, the session is open for all the participants to ask the questions if you have. Or you can just drop a questions that you have in the chat box itself. I'll start with the questions to John. John, in your talk, initially you, you mentioned about advocacy is required more in the developing and underdeveloped countries. 
not the donor countries. So now if you look at the picture of inequality in the world, which also between the countries inequality, and if you look at the pressure and pollution load to the environment also happening in the developed countries as well, like USA. So looking at that picture, don't you think that advocacy also required in the country like uh, USA, Germany, and many other? Well, uh, yeah, Satya, great, great question. And it's a tricky balancing act. We have challenges with safe drinking water and sanitation and hygiene in, in the United States, absolutely. And there are many, many organizations working on that um, at, a, at a national level here in Washington, DC, but in each of our 50 states, and in frankly, all of our major cities and even smaller towns, there are ongoing advocacy efforts in Michigan, in, in California, you name it. Um, they are not all successful. They are certainly not all successful overnight, but they are professional, they are ongoing, and we are, uh, you know, uh, we are making progress. Um, I think that that is the sort of model that I'm looking for in every geography across the world, whether it's, uh, whether it's the United Kingdom uh, or Bangladesh or Kenya or Nicaragua. Uh, governments need to hear from their own people. American governments at different levels need to hear from Americans. The Indian government needs to hear from people, from Indians at a union level, at a state level, at a panchayat level, and so on. Same with Bangladesh and any other country. So governments need to hear from their own people, and those people need to be in constant communication with their governments, not just about how serious these problems are, but about how solvable they are and what their governments can do to accelerate progress. So Satya, I think you're right. I think there were a lot of parallels between advocacy in the United States for water and advocacy in developing countries for water. The opportunity, the white space I see is that uh, in many developing countries, there are very few professional advocacy organizations carrying these messages to their governments. And that's, that's the, the, the white space that I'm trying to fill. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. So, Please, anybody has any question? I have a one question. Please, uh, yeah, please. I have a one question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hiramai Bosch. I'm from West Bengal, Kolkata. Uh, I have a long experience in working in the different rural areas in the South 24 uh, Pragana's districts of West Bengal. I have seen that this is the most of the effect, uh, area is affected by arsenic. So, uh, how to make this advocacy in that area to take the village people get the safe drinking water? Uh, what is your suggestions? Well, well yeah, great, great question. And, and that gives me an opportunity to, uh, to, to, to highlight this, this recipe, uh, sort of the, the need for messages, messengers, targets, timing, and platform. Uh, there, there is no one global water challenge. There are millions of local water challenges. And the problem with arsenic in the water in West Bengal or, or elsewhere across the world, including in, in Maryland, the neighboring state to me in the United States, that, that, is a, that, that is a global, but it is also a very local challenge. So the technical challenge is, is, is one thing. Um, there are technical solutions to removing arsenic from water, where it's, whether it's drilling a well at a different, different depth uh, or somehow removing the arsenic from the water and, and other heavy metals and biological contaminants. That's not my concern. That's doable. That is solvable. The opportunity is how do we get that message of solvability into the people making the political, the programming, and the, the budgetary decisions within that country, within that state, within that district or city? And, and that's the challenge. And I don't have uh, an answer for you from Washington, D.C. for that. Uh, you know, is it, um, is it that arsenic is scary and it's killing people? Over, over the years, over the decades. Well, that's certainly part of it. Is it maybe the fact that water and sanitation are now human rights, according to the United Nations, maybe that will move the chief minister to prioritize arsenicosis in the water in West Bengal. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's not, maybe what will move, what will solve this problem out there is not wash related, but maybe it's, maybe it's more broadly in the health space. Maybe those arguments will work. Maybe, the, maybe embarrassing the government will work. 
you know, unbelievable that people are dying in West Bengal because of arsenic poisoning in 2020, just as they are dying in other parts of the world from arsenic. So I, I don't know the right angle. I don't know the right messages, but the ask is clear. The ask is prioritize arsenic removal from that water to make sure that citizens of West Bengal are not, are not poisoning themselves or not, not being poisoned. But the more specific answers absolutely need to be, uh, uh, need to be designed locally.